ETM going to talk to you about the uh, state primary elections uh, this time. There's a lot going on, and so we have some ground to cover. We'll be necessarily talking about statewide stuff as well as things in our immediate area. So let's see here. We'll bring up the trusty PowerPoint here. And here we go. So, um, to begin with, top two primary. That's what we have in Washington state for most of the history of the state. Uh, we had what was called a blanket primary stemming from 1934 until about 1996. And in a blanket primary, you had a Republican primary and a Democrat primary if there were candidates for any seat in, uh, in Washington state. Uh, that was a partisan election. And um, you could vote for a Democrat in one race and a Republican in the other. Now, parties didn't like this. They didn't want, they were afraid that people would cross over and vote for the worst candidate uh, to try to set up their candidate in better shape. There's no evidence that that ever happened, but parties still insisted upon that. They also didn't like the fact that Washington voters are not required to vote to register to vote by party. You will hear people say, I do at least, well, I'm a registered Republican or I'm a registered Democrat and they're from Washington. I'm like, no, you're not. We do not register to vote by party. So uh, in 1996, California adopted a blanket primary. Parties there sued. Courts ruled that in fact, the blanket primary violated the party's rights to association. That's something you find in the First Amendment. The Bill of Rights. Uh, so parties sued in Washington state, courts also overturned our blanket primary. And so what followed was a series of initiatives to try to restore that. Uh, some bills in the legislature, there were more lawsuits, the governor vetoed one bill. For several years we had what was called a Montana style primary or a pick a party primary. So if there was a primary election, you decided on that day whether you were going to vote Republican or to vote Democrat. And so you, you couldn't switch back and forth. Uh, finally, uh, the US Supreme Court ruled that in fact states could have what we now call the top two primary. And in the top two primary, uh, the two people who get the most votes in the primary advance to the general regardless of party. So, in 2008, via initiative, Washington voters adopted the top two primary, and that's what we have now. There are some trade-offs here. You have some districts in Seattle that are so heavily Democrat, you don't see a Republican survive the primary. So, voters this fall will oftentimes confront two different Democrat candidates on their ballot. Similarly, in Eastern Washington, there's some very Republican districts and those voters will see two Republicans on their general election ballot. Uh, some people say, well, this robs people of choice. Uh, the response would be, in some ways, it's a more meaningful choice. I mean, if what you're choosing between is a Republican who's certain to win and a Democrat who's underfunded and not campaigning that hard, uh, that's not a particularly meaningful choice. If you had two Republican candidates, both of whom are viable, maybe in some ways voters have a better choice that way. But you have to decide what you think about that. In any case, for a dozen years now, we've had the top two primary. It hasn't affected who runs for office, uh, and it doesn't seem to have a negative effect on turnout, whereas the Montana-style primary quickly, clearly did depress voter turnout for primary elections. So. Primary elections are a little different in that the turnout is almost always lower, which means that you tend to get people who are sort of really Republican or really Democrat and moderate voters in the middle are less likely to show up. So let's see here. Now, Washington State Legislature, control of the legislature, of course, is at stake. Every two years, the legislature does a lot of important stuff, state taxes, state regulation. Uh, tuition rates, college funding, a whole host of issues that are decided at the state level come through the state legislature. So these are very, very important elections. 
State senators get elected to four-year terms. There are 49 of them. So roughly half the Senate is up for election every two years. All 98 House members and their two-year terms come on the ballot every two years. And we've got several elections in our area. Here is the map of Washington State legislative districts. The thing you should notice about this is that the different sizes of the districts. So if you look at the 12th district geographically, one of the largest districts in the state, same with the 24th. Here's the thing, because districts have to be within 1% of population, these enormous, geographically speaking, districts have the same amount of voters as tiny districts relatively speaking, in the middle of Seattle. So, and that means that control of the legislature tends to hinge on what happens in the Puget Sound area because overwhelmingly that's where the population of the state resides. So you could win King County and lose nearly the rest of the state and still win a statewide election. So that's something that um, candidates have to confront changes the way you campaign. Um, if you look at the 12th district, you're not going to be doing a lot of doorbelling in a time when you could do that. Whereas in urban suburban districts in King Pearson, Snohomish counties, that's what you got to do. You got to walk neighborhoods and knock on doors. And given what's happening with coronavirus and COVID-19, that really will change the dynamic, I think, of legislative elections in that people are much less likely to doorbell and much less likely to answer the door. Uh, but, you know, candidates may work that out. They may walk around with masks and hope for the best, but uh, we'll see. It may put more emphasis on candidates who can raise money, who can do direct mail, who can reach out to the voters in other ways. So it may change the election quite a bit, but a lot can happen between now and November. Okay, so Puget Sound Legislative Districts, just to give you an idea, look how many they are and how much smaller they are than the districts in Eastern Washington and out on the peninsula. So that ought to give you an idea of where the balance of population is in the state. And these districts tend to be overwhelmingly Democratic. In our own area, in the 33rd District, uh, position one, Tina Orwall is unopposed as usual. Uh, Mia Gregerson, running for her fourth term, is being opposed by a libertarian, Marlisa Melzer. Uh, hasn't raised very much money. Mia's raised much more than Melzer. Melzer is uh, 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 as a, sort, of, sort of a health professional, an anti-vaxxer, uh, says that taxes are too high, but that we're not doing enough for people, and um, is for parental choice, which is an issue that will come back to here in a minute. Um, in, in any case, that's kind of a code word for you shouldn't have to do uh, things with your kids that you don't want to do. And that tends to come down to vaccination and the tragically named comprehensive sex ed bill that passed the legislature in the last session. We'll come back to that. Uh, it's a heavily democratic district. Um, it would be surprising if Mia Gregerson did not get reelected again this time. So near us federal way, we have a, a, a couple of seats where there's a lot more action and, and the outcome is far from certain. In position one, 30th district, which is federal way and a little bit of surrounding areas, but federal way is the heart of the district. So you have Cheryl Hurst, a local businesswoman and volunteer has raised a little bit of money, has got some signs out, seems to be at some level actively campaigning. Janice Clark, who's running as a Republican, um, a veteran uh, complaining about taxes and traffic, which, which of course everyone is concerned about. Uh, Jamila Taylor ran for city council this last go round 2019, she did not win, but undoubtedly that gained her some name recognition. She is the candidate who is picking up the most endorsements. Uh, Federal Way has started to lean Democratic. It used to be more of a swing district, which meant that, you know, the parties were fairly competitive. Uh, she presents reasonably well. Uh, the other Republican in the race is Martin Moore. He is a Federal Way City Councilman. 
a very nice man, very earnest, has a good story to tell uh, in, in, in terms of being a, an, an orphan refugee and uh, being taken in and, you know, having sort of the American dream happen. When he ran for Federal Way City Council, his entire platform from the debates that I moderated seemed to be that he loved Federal Way, uh, which, which is not a particular reason to elect somebody. Uh, in, in any case, he has filed, and this is the thing about the top two primary, is that you put down prefers whatever party, right? So you have people putting down prefers Trump Republican Party, uh, prefers GOP Party. GOP, of course, stands for Grand Old Party, so that means you prefer the Grand Old Party Party. Party on, dudes. Uh, Martin Moore put down prefers independent Republican, and a lot of what he talks about in his campaign is how he's going to bridge the gap between the two sides, which is a a laudable goal stated by many, many candidates in recent decades, and it doesn't ever seem to make a bit of difference. So in any case, um, but to prove that uh, Martin Moore is in fact a real Republican, he says he's against heavy-handed regulation that strangles job growth. Um, I don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, Republicans tend to think that any regulation is bad, whereas Democrats tend to think that, you know, well, regulation is good no matter what. So we'll see. I would expect Taylor and Moore to come through into the general election, and, and it should be a very competitive campaign between the two of them. So uh, we'll see there. Now, in the position two, uh, in the Federal Way District 30th, uh, you have Jesse Johnson. Well, he got appointed to the seat last year uh, after serving on the Federal Way City Council. What I hear and what I observed was that he did all right. He did all right as a, as a first time legislator. Um, his, his main opponent is Jack Walsh, former journalist, local business owner, uh, who also seems to be actively campaigning. Mark Green, a very nice man who runs for something every year, uh, says some odd and interesting things, does not drive, can only get around on his bicycle. I don't know how much he campaigns, but he files for office and he's very earnest. Uh, he's just sometimes seems to be a little bit off. Uh, and uh, I don't think he will again be a factor in this race. So the general election should feature Johnson and Walsh. Now, here's what primary really matters. The closer Walsh gets to Johnson in the primary, the more likely he is to um, attract financial support for the rest of the campaign. But if he gets closer to 40% than to 50%, uh, the money begins to dry up because contributors aren't going to give money to candidates who don't appear to have a real chance of winning. So... That's the 30th district near us. Also, the 47th district, uh, Kent, West Hill of Kent, uh, running a little bit north and south from there. Deborah Entenman uh, seeking a second term. Uh, seems to have done uh, a, a decent job so far and seems likely to be reelected. Uh, Kyle Yebedev uh, is a Republican Party official from King County. And now is time for our first dog break. That's what you get when you're recording at home. Uh, Lebedev does not have a website. He uh, has not raised much money, so it looks like he's just taking one for the team. Uh, this is not expected. Sorry about that. This is not expected to be a particularly good year for Republicans. Uh, a lot of people are unhappy with President Trump and Republicans by and large not having repudiated the president uh, are gonna get tied uh, with with that mantle, and Democrats will attempt to use that. It won't always be successful, but in close elections, it could make quite a difference. State Republicans are very concerned about this, as we'll see when we talk about the race for governor. So, uh, the other seat likely is likely to remain in Democratic hands. Pat Sullivan was going to retire 
from the legislature. But as this is looking out, looking to be, thanks to coronavirus, a terrible budget year, Sullivan, who was the House Majority Leader, said he would uh, run for another term. Uh, the other, there are several Republican candidates in the race. Ted Cook hasn't raised a lot of money. Joseph Simiamo is an interesting candidate in that he is a Covington City Council member. He's raised a little money. And if Sullivan retires after this, he might actually be in a good position in 2022 to take another shot at that seat. So it will be interesting to see just how the primary works out and see if Simiamo, in fact, is is actively and aggressively campaigning for the seat. So statewide races, there's a very fuzzy map of Washington, uh, although I don't think the results are going to be terribly fuzzy. Uh, insurance Commissioner Mike Kreidler, the incumbent, has been there like since before health care, very aggressive in keeping the health insurance and medical industries uh, uh, towing the official line, uh, quite likely to get reelected again. Anthony Welty, a libertarian, not raising a lot of money. Uh, so I don't expect to see any change there. Uh, Secretary of State, now this is an interesting race. Uh, until uh, 2016, Kim Wyman was the only statewide office holder uh, who was a Republican. Secretary of State has a bunch of different duties. But the really important one is that they are the chief election official for Washington State. And uh, Wyman will be seeking uh, a third term. She has campaigned very hard to make it easier to vote. She, she's not somebody who's against mail-in ballots or registering more people to vote during her time. In fact, it's become much easier to vote in Washington state, and she's been out front for that. So there's very little that the Republicans can, uh, 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 the Democrats can attach to her uh, because she's done the things that she's supposed to do. Gail Tarleton, former Port of Seattle commissioner, former state legislator, uh, is attempting to sort of uh, tie the Trump noose around Wyman, but I don't think it's going to work. They've both raised enough money to run for the seat, but really, I, you know, Tarleton is like, you're giving up your legislative seat here, and I'm not sure why. Uh, so I would be surprised to not see Wyman get reelected. Um, there are two other candidates, uh, a, a Seattle real estate guy uh, who's raised a little bit of money, uh, and then a junior high social science teacher from Fife who says he's not going to raise any money has posted a, a series of YouTube videos touting his campaign. I made it through one and a half of them before I gave up and messaged him and said, you know, if you want to tell people what you want to do, get to the point. So uh, in any case, it should be Wyman and Tarleton in the general election and failing some really strange occurrence, Wyman should get reelected again. Uh, I've had her come to class. She's very personable. She does a good job. It's pretty clear. She's in favor of letting people vote. So. State treasurer. Now, this is a very important seat because it um, manages state funds. And so the state takes in all this tax money. It doesn't have to go out right away. So the state treasurer's office is in charge of taking that float, as it were, and investing it in ways to help the state make money. Now, Dwayne Davidson won because of the top two primary in 2016. He's a Republican. He's the only other Republican official. There were five people in the race, three Democrats. The three Democrats split the majority of the vote, which meant that the two Republicans slipped through to the general election, where Davidson, who was the Benton County treasurer, endorsed by 36 out of 38 state county treasurers, uh, won handily. Now, Mike Policiotti has given up that other seat in federal way in the 30th district for the legislature. Now, he did a pretty good job as a legislator and brought some, some interesting knowledge and information. And he's running for state treasurer. Now, he's raised more money than Davidson, but I'm not exactly sure what he has to run on. He says, well, Davidson has uh, has uh, invested state money in things in in stocks that he personally owns. Well, it's all through mutual funds. I mean, it would be impossible for somebody not to do that unless you had no mutual funds. So that seems unlikely. 
Uh, Policiati, I, I mean, I'm, I'm good with him. I, I just don't see him winning this race. So here again, it will depend how they each come through the primary. If Policiati's close, he's going to continue to get funds and he can make a race of it. Uh, if he doesn't get close, uh, it's, it's over. So we'll see. Once again, a very important primary election. Now, Superintendent of Public Instruction. This is a nonpartisan office. It is in charge of K-12 schools. Chris Reichdahl is the incumbent. He ran and won in 2016. He is a, uh, a Democrat, uh, served in the state legislature, was a school teacher and uh, also a school board member. So having somebody who's been a teacher run the schools is almost unheard of. As, uh, as I like to say, those who can teach and those who can't, well, they make education policy, but that's how life goes, isn't it? Um, Reichdahl seems likely to get reelected. His chief opponent is Maya Espinosa. She's raised a little money. She has some, some education background. Uh, she, she's worked on some committees. Uh, her big issue, as it is for a number of people, is something that you may see on the ballot in November, and that is the Comprehensive Sex Education Bill, sponsored by Claire Wilson, senator, state senator from Federal Way. I really want to ask. There are 700,000 words in the English language. Why did you choose those? Most of the bill is not about sex education. Uh, the, the K-5 portion of the bill is sort of basic health and common sense. And yet now you have Republicans and conservatives in the state saying, oh, they're teaching kindergartners how to have sex. That's simply not true. But calling the bill that invites people to think such things. So that'll be the issue on which Espinoza tries to take Reichdahl to task. Uh, Ron Higgins, uh, another Republican, similar sorts of issues. I highlight here Stan Lippman. He runs for something every year. If you just looked at his credentials, he's a PhD, he has a law degree, he's a bit out there. Uh, when he ran for county executive a few years back, he said that, King County should open its own silver mine and coin its own money. There are two problems with that. There are no silver deposits outside of people's cutlery drawers in King County. And two, it's constitutionally prohibited for anybody but the U.S. government to coin money. But um, uh, Mr. Lippman is persistent, if nothing else. So another important race. I would expect to see Reichdahl and Espinoza in the general. Okay, Attorney General. So Bob Ferguson over there is uh, the incumbent, uh, was going to run for governor when it looked like Jay Inslee might actually get nominated for president, but of course he didn't get close. Uh, Ferguson is noteworthy for having sued uh, the bejeebus out of the Trump administration something like 21 times in 120 of the suits. Um, uh, the other three Republicans are all Trump supporters. Um, and, and it's difficult to imagine how that's going to play uh, outside of some rural areas in Washington state. So uh, Ferguson has amassed a lot more money than any of his opponents uh, and uh, is not unpopular in more urban parts of the state. So he's likely to get reelected. I couldn't begin to pick which one of these guys might come through the primary. It might be Mike Vasca. He seems to be campaigning a little bit more. So um, now state auditor. State auditor is the office that makes sure that state agencies are spending money the way they're supposed to. And they do a pretty good job. Chris Labor is a Republican uh, former cop. Joshua Casey, who knows? No picture, no nothing. Uh, Pat McCarthy, the incumbent, getting all the endorsements from all sides of the coin, has more money former Pierce County auditor, uh, appears to have done a reasonably good job. So it's likely to be McCarthy and Leba in the general election. And in a year like this, it's hard to imagine McCarthy not getting reelected. Uh, Commissioner of Public Lands. Now, this is another important seat. Uh, the Commissioner of Public Man Lands manages all the state's timberlands and rangelands and, and, and a bunch of basically state-owned land, which means it's, it's owned collectively for us. Uh, it's supposed to produce revenue. 
but also provide recreation and, and conservation and protecting the environment. So it's a tricky thing because those things don't always go together. Hillary Francis, the incumbent, she was going to run for governor also. Uh, she has raised uh, nearly a million bucks, which is like 10 times more than her nearest competitor. She seems likely to be reelected. The leading Republican in the race is Sue Cool Peterson. Uh, has pretty good experience in, in, in terms of being a fisheries biologist and working on environmental protection and things like that. She just hasn't raised any money, about $11,000. So uh, she will attract some Republican votes and probably come through the primary to the general and then not do all that well. Uh, another interesting candidate to highlight here is uh, Steve Sharon. Uh, his email is 5gkillseverything at gmail.com. Like some other candidates that we've seen, he's out there a little bit. Uh, he, he wants open grazing on state land. Um, he's uh, against a Green New Deal. He's uh, uh, His favorite author that he listed on his campaign site was a guy who's an a, a ex-British ex footballer, now noted conspiracy theorist. So uh, it takes all kinds. One of the things that happened that has affected a number of races in the state is that normally to file for office, you have to put up 1% of the first year's salary of the seat that you're running for or collect signatures equal to that number from registered voters. With all the stay at home orders and all the concerns about coronavirus, that would be difficult to do. So Governor Inslee somewhat understandably waived that requirement and so in some offices we get all kinds of people filing for filing for office and as we'll see in some cases a lot of them uh, lieutenant governor we have 12 people who have filed for this seat uh which is like a record usually this office is just almost an over an, a, a, you know a, a, an oversight and it's something that we just forget about is there lieutenant governor has very few official duties the lieutenant governor presides over the state senate so instead of the speaker of the house you have the lieutenant governor up there wielding the gavel calling a uh, committee of the whole to order um and uh can vote to break a tie now the problem with that is is that there are 49 people in the state senate so a tie is mathematically impossible and at times in the past, they have dragged six senators out of their sick beds to get them to the floor so they can vote and avoid a tie. The other thing is, is that the lieutenant governor fills in for the governor when the governor is away on business. Uh, while Jay Inslee was running for president, I guess the incumbent Cyrus Habib was uh, pretty busy. Cyrus Habib is not seeking re-election. He's going to become a priest. so. There's that. Um, and instead, we have 12 people, three of whom appear to be the more serious candidates. Now, Denny Heck was a state legislator for quite a while. He became chief clerk of the House, which is the top unelected official in the House. He served the last 10 years in the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, decided he'd had his fill of Congress, and then after he came home and Habib said he was not seeking re-election, filed to run for lieutenant governor. Gathered by far the most money here is uh, perhaps the best known of these candidates, um, would be the early favorite to become the next lieutenant governor. That matters more than usual, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Marco Leas is also a longtime state legislator. He ran for uh, state treasurer four years ago and was one of the people who helped tip that race to the Republicans, so they can't be very happy with it. Um, uh, in any case, he's raised enough money to run and, and he should make a go of it, although I heard in 2016 he did not campaign that hard, but we'll see. Ann Davison Sattler ran for Seattle City Council last time and didn't win and has since decided that she's not really a Democrat, but she's a Republican. And so among the Republican candidates for Lieutenant Governor, she seems to be the one raising the most money and campaigning the hardest. In a year like this, very difficult for a Republican to win. Um, 
But here's why this matters. The race for governor. This is kind of what I think of the race for governor. There's Jay Inslee, the loyal, loyal dog there, and all those little piggies in the background. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Inslee um, was okay as a governor in his first two terms. Legislators said he could have been a little bit more involved and he decided he wanted to be president. So early on, he campaigned for the nomination, wasn't getting any traction, eventually dropped out of the race. The thing he talked about most was climate change. Now, I think that's a very important issue. Quite frankly, that's the issue of our times. Uh, on the other hand, in terms of the coronavirus, although a small number of people are very angry at the governor, he's really sort of exhibited a high degree of leadership and taken charge and said, here's what we need to do in order to get through this without lots of people dying. Uh, I, I wish in some ways, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking if you're gonna run for president, that's the Jay Inslee we needed to see, not the one who goes on and on about climate change, which sadly is an issue that it's sort of hard to get people to wrap their heads around. Uh, now, the likely Republican nominee, and this isn't for sure, is Tim Eyman. Tim Eyman has made a career out of uh, sponsoring initiatives. The, our, our friend Bob Ferguson has been suing the heck out of Tim Eyman for uh, uh, illegally taking campaign contributions to enhance his lifestyle. Um, interesting little sidelight a couple of years ago. Uh, Tim Iman got busted for walking out of a staple store with an office chair. He said it was a misunderstanding. I don't know what kind of misunderstanding that is. You either pay for the chair or you leave it there. But in any case, early this year, Inslee had a press conference. Iman was there, kept interrupting him. Inslee shut him down. Finally, Iman left. And Inslee said as Iman was leaving, leave the chair. A plus for timing there, Governor Inslee. Iman's raised several hundred thousand dollars versus uh, several million dollars for Inslee's campaign. He's a polarizing figure. There are certainly people who appreciate his efforts, which are mostly to keep the legislature from taxing nearly everything. Uh, he says that his experience in, in the initiative business will make him a good governor, but um, I'm not sure that that's true because, you know, if, you're, if your goal is to take government apart, uh, you won't get along with the legislature very well. And as it's likely to have Democrat majorities in the House and Senate, that wouldn't be a pretty picture. Now, the one candidate on the Republican side who's, you know, really has sort of, in some ways, at least the experience to do this is Phil Fortunato, longtime legislator from the Auburn area. As he says himself, he's the only one who's worked in and understands the legislative process. And that's a very important point for somebody who wants to be governor. If you know the players and know the system, you're gonna do better than if you're just a newcomer. As I've said before, politics is the only business I can think of where an absolute lack of experience can somehow be painted as a virtue. You want, if you need a plumber, you don't get out in the phone book and look for somebody who says, I've never done this before, but I kind of like pipes. I think politics is the same way, experience matters. So Fortunato is, is, a, is a reasonable candidate. You may agree or disagree with his politics. He's a typical conservative Republican, but at least he would understand what it is that a governor is supposed to do. That being said, he hasn't raised all that much money uh, and that will make it difficult for him to get traction because there are 36 people running for governor in Washington state this time. We're only looking at a couple because the rest of them are who's that and what's that and where did that person come from? Uh, a bunch of independents, various sort of third party affiliations, uh, uh, even a few Democrats, they're not serious candidates. For some people, this just appears to be a hobby. I'm gonna file for office and then not run for it. So um, Joshua Freed, the, one, the Republican who's raised the most money, $1.4 million, half of it's his. He's a developer, he's got some cash. Uh, former Bothell city councilman and mayor. Uh, he got in some hot water there for buying a property after the city decided not to buy it so he could develop it, a golf course, I guess. Um, uh, alone among the Republicans to say, yeah, we probably should be wearing masks and dealing seriously with coronavirus. Um, even though he's raised a lot of money, uh, it's not clear that he will have the name recognition to do 
well. None of the leading Republican candidates has had anything but praise for President Trump, so uh, that won't play well in the Puget Sound region. So Inslee should get reelected. It'll be interesting to see who comes through on the other side as the second candidate, likely one of those Republicans. So uh, an, another very interesting race. Lauren Culp. Lauren Culp is the police chief of Republic Washington. Uh, Republic Washington has about a thousand people. It's the far northeastern corner of the state. Uh, a veteran uh, worked in construction and then decided, hey, I want to be a cop at age 49 and became the police chief of Republic. Now he's gathered some national attention because first he said he would not enforce a initiative passed by the people that uh, uh, a gun regulation initiative because he said it was unconstitutional because you know it's just a short hop skip and a jump from small town police chief to constitutional scholar uh, in any case uh, culp also is uh, anti-mask and uh, anti doing anything realistic about coronavirus um, meanwhile he's taken some heat he's been sued for uh botching a uh, case several years ago involving a young woman who who said she had been sexually molested over time by a relative uh, when other police from another county were assigned the guy immediately pled guilty so that doesn't look very good for mr culp that being said he's raised a fair amount of money i was just driving up north and saw a whole lot of signs for culp in skagit and whatcom county so you know, a guy like that could come through the primary. Um, having no other political experience will might make it more difficult for him, say, if we have debates, but uh, we'll see. Now, this guy all of a sudden has garnered some attention, Raul Garcia. He's a physician from Yakima and has gained endorsements from a number of longtime Republican leaders in the state. I don't think they think he can win. Here's apparently what they're concerned about. If you had a Republican ticket in Washington state that was led by Donald Trump and Tim Eyman, it could be a disaster for Republicans in the state. And here's why. Those are people who are fairly polarizing and that may increase Democrat turnout because you're gonna people show up and say, I don't wanna, I don't wanna see either one of those people in office. And then of course they will vote for other Democrats farther down the ballot. It could mean that Republicans fall even farther behind in the state legislature. Uh, at some point, the Democrats could have sort of that ungovernable majority because you know, they won't be able to get agreement from enough people because everybody's gonna think, well, we need to do this. So um, Democrats are good at that. Uh, Garcia uh, has not held political office before he had a DUI in King County in 2011. It was like 0.25, and uh, uh, he, he, he got that committed to reckless driving. Uh, also, another thing about him is, uh, although he said he's always wanted to be in office, he hasn't actually voted since 2012. That's not a good look. Raised about $150,000. Um, I, I don't see him beating Iman or Culp, so... Republicans' first worst fears may come to pass here. So, what do we know? Ballots drop this Friday, February, July 17th, and uh, you'll get them at home. If you are registered to vote, you can register to vote online. It's very simple, takes about five minutes. You just need a valid Washington State driver's license or state ID. The key there is getting the number in correctly. Uh, other than that, it's pretty simple. And once you're registered, you're always registered until you move away. The ballots are due by August 4th. The ballots come with postage paid envelopes. And of course, there are drop boxes all over King County, including one at Highline College, very close, just off South 240th. So uh, vote early, vote often, uh, stay well and be safe out there.